Michelle. I'm from 3A over here. Um, I'm going to be presenting on Helicobacter pylori. And like Catherine, I chose this because, whoops, wrong one, because my cute little mom right there, she was diagnosed and died of gastric cancer in 2010. She was diagnosed and died in six weeks. Um, I was living in Boston at the time, and when I went back, my doctor wanted to test me for every kind of cancer, because it's very rare in America to have gastric cancer. And it turns out that I, uh, they tested me for H. pylori. I had no idea what it was, and I'm a carrier, so that's why I chose this. Um, and I hope to learn a lot about it. So the common name is ulcers, gastric ulcers, peptic ulcers, um, and it's often referred to as H. pylori, which is the terminology I'll be using today. So, fellow anatomy students, what do we know about the species name right there? What can we detect from that? Pylori. This is an anatomically correct version of a stomach, even though it looks like a sweet potato, it's really not. But if this was a stomach, we have the esophagus here, right? And then it goes into the stomach. This is the antrum, the lower part, the belly. And this is the pyloric region where it colonizes. And then it connects to the um, pyloric sphincter that goes into the duodenum. So H. pylori got its name from where it lives. Who knew? How cool is that? Okay, histology of the stomach. If we looked inside here, does anyone know what the cell types are inside the stomach? Anybody? Andy? People. Work with me. Nothing? Serious? Uh, well, they're, no. Ciliated, epithelial. This is from the Jeffersonian Institute. This is a real live, actual dramatic presentation of a single ciliated stomach epithelial cell right here. Pretty cool. So um, that's what's happening there. Um, and what's really, what's, uh, what's unique about the environment of a stomach? Very good. And what's the average acidity, the pH? 2.0. Well, average healthy is 7, right? pH 7 um, for average for normal homeostasis. Gastric acid, which is produced by the um, parietal cells in the stomach, produces acid at 1.5 to 3.5. So it's extremely acidic. And what we've learned from all of our science classes is that acid destroys proteins. It denatures them, correct? This is why it's so dangerous and we have to maintain a homeostasis. But for the stomach, that's exactly what it wants to do. It wants to denature proteins, right? It wants to break down food, wants to unravel the proteins, so then the chief cells can excrete the enzymes that are going to further break it down. That's the whole point of the stomach, so that's pretty cool. And what keeps the acidity maintained are the proton pumps. So you have your hydrogen, uh, potassium protein pumps. And as a result of producing this, you know, you've got a couple in and a couple out. It also produces bicarbonate, which our body needs to maintain an alkaline balance. So when that pump is going back and forth, it shoots what's known as an alkaline tide out into the bloodstream to, um, as a protection mode. So we're going to learn more about the protein pumps coming up here in a minute. So the causative organism, as I said at the beginning, is Helo Helicobacter pylori. This organism is ancient. It's going to blow your mind how old it is when we get to history. It is ubiquitous in every definition of that word, and it is very, very mysterious. There is so much not known about this organism. It is a gram-negative, microaerophilic, highly motile, super Olympic swimmer like my friend Michael Phelps over here. Urease positive bacterium that colonizes in the stomach of two thirds of the population. 80% um, of infected individuals are asymptomatic, like myself. There's no way I would know I had H. pylori unless my mother passed from gastric cancer. Um, many, does anyone in here have H. pylori, by the way? I mean, that we know of. See, that's the thing. Who runs into their doctor and's like, hey, test me for H. pylori? Nobody does that. So, humans and primates are the natural hosts. Um, this fact right here I thought was super cool. Each mammal has its own <coughs> helicobacter species that is highly, if not exclusively, specific to the host. I think that's kind of cool. There has to be something going on there with natural selection. Um, and it is the most common bacterial infection afflicting humans today. So check that out. That's pretty cool. We're going to learn a lot about this guy. So the identifying features, okay, fellow students here. What is the morphology? Spiral. Spiral, very good. This is actually
actually an inaccurate photo. So, if this wasn't here, what is the flagellar arrangement? I can't hear you. People? Yes, who said that? Bingo, if I had a prize for you. And if this was accurately presented with one on each end, it would be ampy, exactly. And I put this cute little picture of the horse tail. See, top horse tail, longest horse tail in the world from Guinness Book of World's Record, by the way. Um, now, what do we recognize an enzyme on here? <laughs> Very good. And what do we know about urates? And bring in any bells from maybe a lab? Uh, yes, it does. And we did a test in lab 12. This will be on our lab practical, so we do need to know about it. The results, I didn't have a slide, but this is the test that we used for it. So it's testing the bacteria's ability to hydrolyze urea and its production of urease, the um, enzyme that does that. Um, it is also one of its main uh, virulence factors, along with adhesins, because it has ability to stick. This is like the superhero, Superman of all organisms. He's pretty crazy. Um, so we do know for a lab practical that a negative result is yellow, which means um, the interpretation is that it, is, it doesn't have the ability to hydro, hydrolyze urea and that the urease is absent, so that's a negative sign. If it's all pink, which was the rest of our results, that means it's rapid urease hydrolysis for our test coming up, you're welcome, and that it does possess the bacteria and that's a positive sign. Um, so what else was I gonna tell you about that? I think that's it. Oh, one really quick note about that is all organ, many, not all, but most organisms possess urease, but only members of the Proteus, the Morganella, Morganella and the Providentia genuses are considered to be rapid urease uh, positive bacteria. So moving on to the historical facts. This kind of blew my mind. The etiology of H. pylori um, is thought to uh, have been present in our humanoid ancestors over four million years ago. But it is absolutely proven that it's been colonizing in our stomachs for over 58,000 years since at least the Paleolithic times. I think that's pretty cool. It has to tell you something about the bacteria. If it has evolved and lived this long, is it really a bad thing? Up till now, we've treated it. It's like, we don't know what it is. Kill it, oh my God, get it out of here. But it's, it keeps lasting, so you really have to, as a scientist and a person in general, you have to ask the question of why is it still here. Cool thing about this, this bacteria won a Nobel Prize via his discoverers, uh, Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, um, in 1982 for its discovery, but mostly because of the causative link between its role in gastritis and peptic ulcer disease. Um, in 1982, when this was discovered, it was, and even today, it's still people think that the cause of it, um, of gastric ulcers are stressed, you know, you're stressed out, you're eating too much acidic food or spicy food, that is a complete fallacy. And people today still strongly believe that. Um, so hooray for these guys. And they are role models as far as scientists because, um, a little antidote here, um, they kept challenging uh, prevailing dogmas, and I really like that because they were real ridiculed by their peers who did not believe it was possible for any bacteria to live in such a harsh acidic environment as the stomach. Lo and behold, these guys were like, I just know it, I know it, I know it, and I'm gonna keep proving it. So what Marshall did in 1984, after trying to infect baby piglets unsuccessfully, he did an endoscopy in his stomach uh, for H. pylori, came out negative. So he drank a Petri dish with cultured H. pylori in it. This is a true story, it's in his Nobel report, you can read about it. He's crazy, just to prove his point. To his surprise, in just three days, he started developing symptoms. And after eight days, he did a repeat endoscopy and biopsy to discover that the H. pylori had cultured in his gut. So he went on and did this a couple more times. He went through the cost, um, cost, uh, postulates to demonstrate a causal relationship between H. pylori and gastritis. This was a huge breakthrough um, in the understanding of the causative link between H. pylori and stomach cancer. And those are the only two things, by the way, that is conclusively linked to, is peptic ulcers and stomach cancer, just for the record. Okay, the symptoms, um, what I'm gonna do really quick is show you this video, because I think after you see this, it'll be pretty clear what the symptoms are. Um, and if 
perfect world when this all works just the way I want it to. Ready, go. some of that acid and break down, you're going to have a, a lot stronger pain during that time. In severe cases, darker black stool um, from the blood um, leaking out through the ulcers, vomiting that can look like coffee grounds, weight loss. My poor mom was like about this big around, little munchkin. Wasn't pretty. Um, so this is a legendary photo. This lady, um, Lissandra West, took this picture and won a scientific award for it. And I just love it so much because it's that Wait, 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 wait for it. It is, what's happening here, is the H. pylori is colonizing the ciliated epithelial cells. We'll just pretend that this corkscrew is a little spiral. And he actually goes between the cilia. He doesn't penetrate the skin, which what everybody thinks, the tissue. He actually just lives in between um, the cilia, which I think is pretty cool. So if you look at him right here, this is all the cilia. How cool is that? And this was taken with a uh, scanning electron microscope, or we never see this. And here's their little um, flagella, and they're curling and digging in in between the mucus layer. So that's what's going on here. You can see in the background these little ridges. That's the rugae lining the stomach, which allows it to expand. And there's a really thick mucus layer along there. So he penetrates through the mucus layer, and then he huddles right in here in between the cilia. I, oops, pardon me, chair. Um, so that's what's going on there. So he infects in the antrum, in the lower part, and here's the pyloric region up here. Um, that's where he lives. And then he causes uh, inflammation in the gastric mucosa. Um, so, and this is often asymptomatic. The chronic inflammation, um, because of these being a, the, all of the T cells, um, there's a high um, amount of T cells with this infection, um, coming there all the time, it causes chronic in inflammation, and that's what leads to the ulcers. So, um, incubation period, unknown, it's a mystery. Um, they, they, there's so much that they don't know about this, and this certainly is, is, uh, is one of them. Um, the duration of the disease, if undetected, like myself, um, is a lifetime, and um, if it is diagnosed, eradication rates are between 61 and 94%. Um, but this is highly variable because there's a lot of antibiotic resistance, and plus the host specificity, there we go, um, with this organism, there's a lot of uh, treatment failure with this. Um, so there you have it. Transmission is also unknown. You will hear in all of the videos, and all of my research came from scientific journals, you'll hear the word may be transmitted, um, may be contracted, but there is no definitive, 100% agreed upon conclusive data to support anything. What's thought to be the causes of trans or the modes of transmission are horizontal transmission um, from a mother to a child. Also, orally is a big one they're considering um, with contaminated water and foods. And also, genetics is a huge one in the um, in the spotlight right now. They wanted to do genetic testing on me and all of this crazy stuff and um, lots going on. I, I I didn't follow through with anything. And currently, if I have had no treatment for it, I am 100% asymptomatic. But the NIH says that first-degree relatives of people with gastric ulcers have a two- to three-fold increase of risk of getting gastric cancer. So who knows? The apple didn't fall far from the tree, as you can see. But did I get it genetically? 
Or I could have gotten it orally because I lived in Asia for a long time without running water or electricity and was extremely ill on several occasions and almost died there. So who knows? I mean, I'll never know. Um, prevention, no, no means of uh, prevention. You are S-O-L. Did anyone get that? Uh -huh. Hello, that's funny. <laughs> Shit out of luck. <laughs> okay, so treatment, um, antibiotics to kill H. pylori. The NIH has their cocktail uh, triple therapy regime, but as I said earlier, um, they are not 100% effective, and they only offer them to you if you're symptomatic. Otherwise, they don't offer them to you. Uh, stop or limit the use of NSAIDs. We all know what they are. Okay, um, non serotonin anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen and aspirin. Now, why would that be important? Why would you want to stop using anti-inflammatory drugs? Because it's the inflammation response, right? That is our first responders to help. It protects tissue damage. So you're countering the um, support of your immune system when you take those. Proton pump inhibitor, like we talked about earlier, that's what maintains acidity level in the stomach. Or what doctors are prescribing right now is asymptomatic, just let it be. And here's another really quick um, video for you. In a perfect world again, perfect world. When I say Xerox, chances are you don't think of insurance claims. You're absolutely As in the right. 900 million help. We don't, and we don't care. So, okay, check this out. This is what's really going on. Sore that develops in the lining of the lower part of your esophagus, or various parts of your stomach, or small intestine. <coughs> A peptic ulcer in your esophagus is called an esophageal ulcer. In your stomach, it is called a gastric ulcer. When the ulcer affects the first part of your small intestine, called the duodenum, it is called a duodenal ulcer. When you eat, your stomach produces highly acidic digestive juices, also known as stomach acid, to help break down food. Then, the food passes into your duodenum for further digestion and subsequent absorption into the bloodstream. To protect your organs from the corrosive effects of stomach acid, a layer of mucus coats the lining of your stomach and duodenum. When the protective mucus layer breaks down, stomach acid can seep into the lining of your stomach or duodenum and cause an ulcer. Most peptic cool. ulcers are caused by the bacteria Helicobacter pylori, also known as H. pylori. Scientists think these bacteria may enter your body through may contaminated food or water, or <coughs> through close contact with an infected person. Once inside your body, they lodge in the mucus layer of your stomach or duodenum. As the bacteria grow, they damage the mucus layer, allowing stomach acid to reach the stomach or duodenal lining. Together, the bacteria and stomach acid cause an ulcer. Some peptic ulcers are linked to heavy usage of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, also known as NSAIDs, including aspirin and ibuprofen. These drugs reduce the ability of your stomach and duodenum to protect themselves from the effects of stomach acid. Your doctor... Okay, the doctor's going to have a nice day. We're out of here. Okay. There we go. Yay. Okay. So, um, where are we? Okay. So the incidence, um, the incidence, now the thing with, oops, wrong page. Um, the incidence rates, first of all, let's just be clear on a quick definition. Prevalence is a percentage of um, population affected with a particular disease at a given time versus incidence, which is new infections. Now, this, because of the ubiquity of this organism, is very hard to determine. Um, but globally, it is estimated by the World Health Organization that over 70% of the population carries this virus, me being one of them. <laughs> Um, and in developing countries, um, it's 3 to 10% of the population. Global population as of April 2013 is uh, 7,117,000,000 people, so it is definitely ubiquitous. In the United States, the current population is just over 318 million. The prevalence is estimated at 30%.
It's lower because of our higher socioeconomic status, our ability to have clean water, et cetera, et cetera. They think that's a huge contribution to it. And calls, so there's 350,000 new cases diagnosed each year in the U.S. Now, this is just for um, peptic ulcers, mind you. And in Colorado, there's no specific data on it. Um, but that's what we uh, have there of 30%. We could say 1.5 million in Colorado, roughly. Mortality, same thing. Um, 42 deaths per million per year. United States, it says complications of peptic ulcers cause an estimated 6,500 deaths each year. But most of them are from the NSAIDs because of the bleeding out rather than the H. pylori. So H. pylori could actually be our friend. He could, their scientists are thinking right now that he could be part of our natural biota and really important in maintaining homeostasis. Um, stomach cancer, the big thing I've got to say about that is that's the strongest causative link between H. pylori. And um, even though it's the second um, most common type of cancer worldwide, and it's six times higher than in the U.S., when my mom was diagnosed, it is considered one of the rarest. So rare that if you go on the National Cancer Institute's website, it is not even listed on there at all. The top 12 um, common uh, cancers in the U.S., our pancreatic number one, followed by breast and lung. Nowhere on there is gastric cancer even mentioned. So that's how rare it is in the U.S. and for my poor mom to have it. Um, isolation techniques, we're finishing up here. All terms we're going to use in our lab, first isolated in 1982 by our friends that won the Nobel Peace Prize. The biopsies are seeded into 7% uh, blood agar plates like we use in the lab, incubated at 37 degrees centigrade um, for up to five days. Samples can be obtained with or without an endoscopy. The rapid, oh dang, the rapid urease test is what we've already performed in week 12. Um, these are the, the histology test, basically works like the ELISA for antibodies. And then isolated strains are identified using universal phenotypic methods. So we have the um, typical morphology, the gram staining, the positive urease, which we already did. And today, as soon as I'm done talking, we're gonna do the oxidase and the catalase test. Um, for our upcoming lab practical. So food for thought. You just have to ask yourself, is this a friend or foe? And if you had it, would you um, want to eradicate it? For me, I'm voting no right now because there's so much new information coming out about it. And um, just to finish up here, all the new science in this biological company has invented this new technology, Helicobacter pylori platform technology, in which they attach a vaccine onto a live helicobacteria infection and use it as a vector to deliver the vaccine and they're doing that with H1N1 right now. So that is pretty cool. And that's all I have to say. There's a 25 second animation of, um, that I can give you the link to to watch this um, deliver a vaccine. It's absolutely amazing. And that's my presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs>